we're having massive scaling problems today trying to uh, join together the very information-centric web model with the very host-centric uh, TCP IP model. If you look at how the net has evolved, it, it started as a telephone system for computers. The, the model was computers wanted to exchange data. Or people wanted their computers to be able to exchange data. The model we had for communication for 140 years had been the phone system. So we said, okay, they want to have a conversation because communication is conversation over long distances. And so let's make protocols and infrastructure that allows computers to have a conversation. Uh, first cut of that, things like the ARPANET, networks that would handle different bandwidths. Uh, they didn't require all of the global clock distribution of a tel telephony network. Instead, they substituted uh, buffering. And one crucial thing coming out of Paul Barron was uh, unlike the phone system where the communication was all about building a wire you know, hop by hop, link by link between the two endpoints. It was basically uh, instructing the switching system how to make one long wire. Uh, Paul said, don't do it that way. Just identify the endpoints and let the network take care of getting the data there. So this is great. It's just completely changed the world. But the bulk of that change was didn't happen in the 70s and 80s and early 90s when the net was first growing out. It happened in the late 90s and the 2000s when the web took off. And it had nothing whatsoever to do with computers having a conversation model. It had to do with people creating and consuming content. And the web sort of showed us for the first time what happens if we leave behind this 18th century model of telephony and instead we start to look at not the wires but the information in the wires and and the web gave us a structure where you could name information not the process of getting it but the information itself say i, I want this web page i want this youtube video i want this amazon personal page uh, and you would get back a set of content some thing that represented that name that you gave what if we recast the way we think about the low-level infrastructure, not, don't say the web is an overlay on top of TCP IP, which is the way it's implemented today, but say if 99% plus of what we do is web-like stuff, is there a model that lets us do the same stuff at the packet level? Or could we make it the basis of our communication rather than saying it has to be an overlay? So you can create videos, you could put them on your own website, and you have to pray that they never get popular. Because if they get popular, your ISP is almost immediately going to shut you down because your link will be completely saturated. You know, what we used to call a slash dot effect. But that's intrinsic to the conversational model, right? We, we don't do broadcast TV by making phone calls to a TV station. If you want to put media distribution over TCP IP, you have to figure out some way to lie to the network so that YouTube.com, which TCP thinks is a location, is identified by an IP address, you gotta make sure that it's not a location, that it's spread across the entire planet. So while we spent most of the 90s growing the internet and having the protocols work for us, now if you look at YouTube, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, all of these, very heavily used services that manifest themselves to the net as an IP address. Looks like a single location, but if they're a single location with hundreds of millions of users, the traffic in a conversational model always scales like the popularity. It scales like the number of consumers. And if you're doing 
Twitter update or a video that wants to be seen by millions, you, you can't deploy it in a conversational model, and we spend all our time fooling the net. Information that's sort of qualitatively the same, it's all naming or identity information, but it's spread randomly across the whole damn packet. So we've got source and destination addresses that conventionally we think of as layer three, and so it's up at front to be used by the network layer. And then we've got ports that uh, are layer four, and so they're a little bit deeper in because they're supposed to be used by the end node for its demoxing to get you to a particular application. And then inside of that, we've got sequence numbers, which are being used when you get to the application for it to reassemble the larger unit. And inside of that, we've got URLs, which are used by uh, a higher level part of the application than on transport part of the application. You've just got all of this information. It's all fundamentally name information. It's what do these bits mean? Well, if you pull together the source addresses, the ports, the sequence numbers, the URLs, they all give you context for the information. They're all the name of the information. What if rather than having, you know, Amazon's load balancer, which is trying to figure out, all right, which of my 50,000 unused machines is per currently handling this customer's request. So I, I have to look at the addresses, I have to look at the ports, I have to look at the sequence numbers, I have to look at the cookies in order to dispatch the sucker to where it's going. What if I say packets have a name on the front? And all of that information just gets collected to the name. And at any point in the network, you look at as much of that name as you need to look at to do your job. If just the front part will work, because all you're doing is gross level steering, just look at the front. If you need to look at more of it, it, we don't have layers. What we have is a set of structured information. There's, we know that we're going to be looking at different parts of it for different reasons, so we put topologically sensitive information like Amazon.com, stick that at the front, because uh, you can use that to make scalable routing tables. But when it gets there, we don't want to say there's a transport protocol and you know there's various layers just say, yeah, there's a job that I'm doing when I get to Amazon.com and it requires me to look at this much. If you don't care where you're getting the data, if all that matters to you is what the data is, not where it comes from, then all of this memory that has to be in the network as buffering in order to, to manage the multiplexing of the network suddenly that becomes a viable source of data. You know, the way it happens today is you're watching a YouTube video. That means the bits leave some server at YouTube. They go into the downstream gateways memory. They get pulled out of that memory, put into a wire, go into the next top gateways memory, and they're going bouncing memory to memory uh, through all these interconnecting wires till they get to you. If the two of us are watching the same video, then the immediate upstream gateway gets one copy of the video going to me and then another separate copy of exactly the same video going to you. They both went through that gateway's memory. It's because of this conversational abstraction that we're putting on because the gateway doesn't know that we're consuming the same content, what it sees is two different conversations. It can't look in its memory and say, oh, I've got that. I can give it to you. Uh, you have to fetch a new copy, and you have to fetch it all the way from YouTube. And then that's what's giving us the abysmal scaling, is the, the having the load scale like the popularity is strictly a function of the data can only originate at one place. And if you just cared about the data, just start going towards that place, and as soon as you run into the data, okay, now you've got a copy, you're done with your distribution. 